Good afternoon. Hello. Thank you so much for staying. My name is Jenny Gersten, and I am the vice president and producer of musical theater here at New York City Center. I, uh, I want to thank you for being a wonderful audience this afternoon. You were fabulous, and you are one of the 15 audiences that gets to see what I consider a once-in-a-lifetime event to see the survival of Titanic with this incredible cast. But, um, here is Jonathan Tunick, our orchestrator, our band, maestro, our musical. We'll be joined in a few minutes. We'll be joined in a few minutes by a few cast members. But I did want to spend, because of this extraordinary score of Titanic, written by Maury Yeston, of course, uh, I did want to spend extra attention at this talk back today on music. But before I do that, I want to give a quick shout out because I don't know if you are musical theater lover like I am. This cast is so stacked. And while I like to think that that's a testament to you know what we do here, and a little bit it is, it is mostly a testament to our casting directors. So I don't know if he's here, Bernie Telsey, but Telsey and company who does all of our casting at Encores for the last couple of seasons, they are, they are the you know, casting directors, unsung heroes of theater, right? Like the Tony Awards of tomorrow. They don't get nominated, they don't get considered, but they are so much a key ingredient to why shows are so special. So I do, I don't know if he's here, but I do want to just give a special shout out to the casting directors in the theater, and especially the casting company. Craig and Rachel did this one. Thank you. Um, okay, Rob Berman. Um, you know, Mary Mitchell, who's our, 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 our in-house encore's MD, was supposed to MD this, but uh, she had a conflict, and so we got to call you. And honestly, what a lucky break. I mean, no disservice to Mary Mitchell, but it feels so right that you're up there. I mean, I'm just, again, going to channel my music theater geek for a second. Is this the best? Doing 30 pieces, getting to conduct 30 pieces? Oh yeah, I mean, um, someone asked, is this the biggest orchestra we've had at Encores? And the answer is no. We've had orchestras this large and larger, but um, this uh, score, when, when, you, when you guys called me, I said absolutely yes, I'll be there, because just to get a chance to conduct this orchestral score that Jonathan orchestrated and that Mari wrote, that is sweeping and cinematic at times and epic. And it's it's a big, you know, it's, it's conducting the show is like steering the, the ship. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but it is, it is a joy. It is a joy and so many friends and, and colleagues of mine in the company and in the orchestra, it's been a wonderful time for me to be back, back here. She won the Tony Award, which was the first time they ever gave an orchestrator a Tony Award. Um, I, I, I think these orchestrations are astonishing. What, what, I, I have a couple of questions. Maybe can you, I know you get asked this all the time, can you explain a little bit how you take the raw material of what a composer gives you and you breathe life in it, into it? I think you've said it's similar to lighting design and that you're painting colors where there were none. But can you talk a little bit about that for a second? Well, the whole thing about the reference to the lighting design, like most interviews I've given, have been 
grossly exaggerated. <laughs> well, clear, well, well, here's a chance to set the record straight, Jonathan. Most composers write their accompaniments for piano. And what the orchestrator does is interpret the piano accompaniment so it's suitable for an orchestra. In the process of doing that, we have the power to bring to bear the immense scope and power both in interpretively and in might of the orchestra, which is okay. far more flexible than the piano. I would say the biggest difference between the work I did with Sondheim and Titanic is that Steve uh, never, never was inclined to epic, and this is an epic. <laughs> so it, it was a, a chance to do something quite different, and I'm, I'm not suggesting Steve Sondheim was incapable of the epic. <laughs> the, uh, the, just never quite happened with him. Um, his, his shows tended to be more internal, and uh, so this was, this was quite different. This is this is big. It's on a big scale. Thank you. And um, I want to. Uh, you and I were having. I told you that my favorite part of this orchestration is in the blame when um, the, there's a motif that happens underneath it. Um, <laughs> you like that I picked your song? Okay, cool. <laughs> um, there's a, I don't want to sing it. Not, Rob, can you do it? The hardest part? Uh, no, I can't sing the hardest part. <laughs> <laughs> there's a little, yeah, but there's a very, Harpsichord that's underneath the blame that's counterpuntal to the to the to the song, and I, I I I told you my admiration for that moment, and you replied that you picked the sound of harpsichord because well I I tend to invoke the harpsichord when I want something annoying. <laughs> And I said that that's because the blame, they're all kind of pointing fingers at each other. Exactly. So it, it gets the audience, exactly. the listeners, kind of agitated with them. And that was really interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, oh, I, I think I want to start with Judy and Chip on this one. Judy, you've been on the stage a lot. Chip, it's your first time. Um, I think, uh, what did it mean to you both? Because, Chip, you were just in harmony and you were so astonished. You had a big, big But, um, we're never going to get through this if you keep clapping. <laughs> um, what made you say yes to Titanic? Because I do think this is a huge ensemble show and I want to know what, what drew you to it. I'm still trying to figure it out. It was, <laughs> it, it's terrifying. Uh, to, to learn all this material so quickly, you know, uh, and there's a lot of really agile young performers who just, you know, the scripts were down on the table early on, and I'm out there every, every minute trying to learn it. Uh, you know what? I, I saw it originally, and I just it's just a great show, and I thought it just would be a lot of fun to be with all these incredible people. Judy keeps me uh, active. Backstage tells me when I, tells me when to enter, and you know it's just, <laughs> uh, it's you know it's it's kind of a blast, you know that's that's the thing. You didn't know that when you said yes. Well, I, I did one years ago. Oh. Yeah, I did applause years ago, but uh, this, this felt more. Uh, I don't know. This felt harder. <laughs> Had to do with uh, all those songs, like uh, you know, dressed in your pajamas in the grass lot. You know, it's hard. <laughs> Yeah, I said to Bonnie, I said, you know, being in first class isn't so great because you have to sing a lot of patter songs. You're better off in second class. <laughs> <laughs> patter songs? <laughs> yeah. uh, my next question is for 
questions for Bonnie. She's going to pass it to Bonnie. Um, so you're backstage at Kimberly Akimbo. And you, and you hear the news that we're doing Titanic. Yes. And you're with Victoria Clark, who originated the role did, of yeah. Alice Bean. And you're like, I want to play it. Is I mean, what, was there anything there? Was there synergy? Um, I had a friend actually mention it first. As soon as it was announced, he texted me and said, so you're playing Alice Bean, right? Because you and Vicky. And I was like, oh, <laughs> who knows? And then I got... Um, I'm a frequent uh, visitor to City Center, and so I got my City Center mailer, and it said, and that's when I saw it was directed by Annie Kaufman, who I've done several readings with, so I have her number. So I just, I'm not gonna lie, y'all, I texted her. And I said, what if I was your Alice Bean? And she said, wait, are you serious? And I said, yeah, why not? And then she goes, I'll get back to you. And like a day later, I got the offer. And um, she said, what if I would have told you no? And I said, well, then that would have been fine. It, you know, it's whatever. It, it doesn't hurt to ask. She's like, if I thought you weren't right for it, and you are so right for it. And I was like, well, you never, you always ask. It was so great, because Vicky came on and did like a little yeah. cameo the other night. It was very sweet to see yeah. you. Yeah, and she actually came back this afternoon. She caught the beginning, because she was backstage during the beginning. When she was our Miss Passenger the other night, so she came back to watch the opening tonight. Today, she was with you. <laughs> and and um, why don't you pass it to Brandon? Brandon. Hi. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, um, so this character that you're playing yeah. is May. Not how we've seen you before. <laughs> was that was that an attraction? Very much so. Yeah. Um, and it was something that Annie said to me early on. She's like, you've never, I don't think people have seen you play a part like this before in New York, and I would love to see what you bring to it. And I was like, thank you for the opportunity. I mean, I'm always hungry to do things that like, you know, I, as actors, we always get sort of pigeonholed and put into our, our respective boxes. And, you know, I, I think I've done okay in that box. Um, but I, there's so much more that I have to offer as an actor. and. Um, I was so grateful to Annie to give me that chance. Um, and I'm just having such a blast being a bad guy. It's so, it's fun. It's fun. Thank you. Uh, honey, go on. Thank you, take the mic. Um, uh, you know, we got to, we had the, ple the pleasure of seeing you in Funny Girl uh, a year and a half ago. And you have quite a full, a full career. What what uh, what drew you to Titanic? Did you know the show when we called you about it? I don't think you did, right? I did not yeah. know. Um, thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. Um, I, well, seven of the many reasons I wanted to say yes to this was is right here on the stage. Um, again, like Chip was saying and what Bonnie was saying, I wanted to work with Annie and this wonderful company, and just. And it's turned out to be a great decision. My whole life has been based on instinct, and my instinct said, you gotta do this, and it'll be a lot of fun. And there's, you know, for such a tragic story, there's a lot of joy within the company to help tell this tale, and I'm, I'm so glad I did. Great, and thank you for getting all the tattoos for the role. I thought that really, it really helps. You do what you can, you know. <laughs> there's Brando, you know, you learn from the best. Jose Lara. Oh, so, Jose, you know, here's the thing. This casting process, if you haven't gotten sort of the impression, a lot of it happened where, like, Annie Kaufman, our director, was on the subway or would bump into someone at an event and be like, do you want to be in Titanic? <laughs> that was less true for Ramina and Jose. You were the last person to join, well, like, I think the last person because you, we needed to replace um, Conrad. So, um, did, the, did the short amount of time between when you got the job and when you started rehearsal, which was... Did you, did, was that a little, I mean, it's fast anyway, but that was fast. It was pretty fast, but I, I, I gotta be, I have, to, I have a huge confession to make. When actually, when they, when they announced it, that they were doing Titanic, I literally was like, I wanna play that part. I, I had my eye on oh, you visioned I really it. Did. I literally, I was like, that, cause I saw it in 97, and I was like, that's, that's Michael Service, and I want, I wanna sing that. I wanna sing that stuff. Well, that's, I have to say, it sits on your voice really well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> But like, but when it, you know, and then it, you know, and you know, Conrad's my brother. Like we, we did here, let's up together, and you know, so. But and you know, you when it didn't happen, I just kind of released it. I'm like, great, can't wait to go see and support Conrad, you know. And then, 
And then it landed in my lap. And it's like, sure, yeah. And, and, and when the announcement came out, I'd already been kind of like re-listening to the, to the cast album over and over again, the way that I'd done for the past 20 years. And um, the, I, the, I joke that I've had to relearn, because I'm singing kind of like the, the, the baritone part now in all the group singing. I had to kind of override my, my like muscle memory, because in my bathroom for the past 20 years, I've just been singing the melody for, for, for you know, every time I'm singing, you know, Great Ship Titanic, I'm just singing the melody, I'm like, oh, no, 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 baritone this time, baritone, baritone. Um, but no, the, I've, I've loved this show since, since it premiered, and I'm um, just happy to, to join in. It feels like summer camp, but everyone's a Broadway star. That's what it was like, that, oh, that's what it was like the first day of rehearsal, you all walked into the room, and every time you walked in, you said, I can't believe who's in this room. It was such a wonderful thing. Um, Rob, I have one more question for you, and then audience will have a time for a couple of questions from you. Uh, so think about that for a second. Rob, in terms of prepping for um, music directing this uh, uh, and setting even your team to think about all these different vocal, because it's such an ensemble of choral singing, um, do, do you prepare differently for this than, say, I don't know, Into the Woods or even Light in the Piazza? Is it a different? mindset that you put yourself in? That's an interesting question. Um, uh, not really. I mean, I think my process is is the same no matter what the piece is in terms of really learning the material and, and understanding it and figuring out the best way to teach it, the best way to, uh, you know, uh, work with the orchestra on it. So I, I don't think it's, I think my process is, is pretty consistent. Um, but uh, I do want to give a shout out to the great Ben Whiteley, who is my associate on this, who has been working at Encore since the beginning, and he did all of the choral preparation and did a beautiful job. Yeah, I thought it was great. I mean, I remember that first day of rehearsal, you were singing the opening number in like less than an hour of going into it. That was so impressive. That was very exciting. It was very exciting. Sorry, I was there. There, was a, there was a meeting, though, back in January where Andy Kaufman wanted to go through the score. So Mary Mitchell and I played four-hand piano and sang the whole score, just the two of us. And yeah, it was never as good. <laughs> Rob, being a man of great modesty, won't say this for himself. So I'm going to say it for him. This show is a tour de force for a conductor. And Rob has done a splendid job doing this. I've worked with a lot of conductors in my time. I've even been one. And th this was just about the best I've ever experienced. Okay, thank you. There's about 10 minutes for questions from you all. Uh, raise your hands, we'll try to get to your questions. The sentence has to end in a question mark. It can't be a statement of belief. It has to be a question, okay? That's the compact. Um, this woman with her hands so high in the middle back here, what is your question? Well, she raised her hand for me. Okay. <laughs> in the play, right before uh, Edward says, who called for speed and break every record? Who insisted we land a bassoon Right after that, what do you all say? Because I can never tell you. <laughs> um, Brandon, take the mic and repeat the question, please. Um, he asked, uh, after EJ, the captain, asks, um, who called for speed and to break every record? Who tried to land ever sooner? I say, uh, uh, what do I say? <laughs> Maybe that's the problem. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I say, uh, who took a course too far north for the season? And then so you start overlapping. And then we start overlapping. And I say, who had to have both the largest and fastest? Who, who, did it? who should have set up more lookouts? Who should have posted more lookouts in darkness? Uh, what did that mean? He says something. And then it's the who did it? Who did it? Who did it? Who did it? Thank you. A question in the grand tier, maybe? Yeah, yeah, right there. Blue shirt. He's asking, you know, what does it feel like to be the one up there who has to kind of hold it together, basically? 
and yeah, yeah. Now, now that you've put it that way, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna be nervous to go on tonight. But, um, no, uh, you know, I, I, I've been doing this for a while, and, and so, you know, I, I, it's just experience, like anything, the more experience you have doing something, then the more comfortable you are. Over there in the aqua green blouse, yes, you. Oh, I was actually talking about the person behind you. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so first of all, awesome job. Great job tonight. And second, what advice would you give to other coming and young composers who want to do Broadway work? Oh boy. <laughs> advice for up and coming composers who want to write for Broadway. <laughs> Things have changed a lot since I was a young would-be. Um, it is so hard to get a show on now, and I'm difficult to know where to start. You know, I would say surround yourself with colleagues. Just meet a lot of people in the business. So much of it is being in the right place at the right time. Be in a lot of places at a lot of times. <laughs> um, over there, the gentleman in the green shirt. <laughs> the question was, will we record it? I'm thinking about how to make that possible, actually. <laughs> song every day for a month before we started. I didn't even have the music. I just was like, I have to know what this is. Um, and I think this is hard to like bring what we can to it that isn't, you know, I didn't get to see the original. I just, I just I got to hear the album. So it was a lot of going in the corner and me and Drew figuring out what our Edgar and Alice were like. So it's, it's, it's a fun challenge. To add, that, you know, the, the process of encores is it's so fast that you it's not like doing a normal production where you have time to develop things. So you have to just trust your instincts and just go for something and 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 be forgiving of yourself when you get out there and you go, wait, what is that lyric? Uh, and of your colleagues. And <laughs> Also, uh, it, it helps to take lots of previces. <laughs> you heard it here. Uh, another question from the Grand Tier? I still want to miss you. Any, any? Yeah, over, over there, yeah. I mean, my song is about death. Uh, oh, sorry, she asked what it was What was it like for the characters on stage who were preparing for death, basically. That's almost all of us on Bullet, except you're the only one. No. No, these two, sorry. <laughs> You know, I, what, I think that's one of the eternal questions of the show and of the play is, is, is how, how does, what, what is your humanity when you know you see your death in, in, in right in front of you? And I think particularly the last half of the show is, is about that and what these different characters, um, how, their, your real personalities and your real humanity come through and particularly in their song, you know, in, in this beautiful, beautiful song still. That, you know, in, in, in the throes of seeing their, their, their death coming, they're calm and they're just showing their love to each other. And I think that's the most beautiful part of the show. 
you know, and so I think um, a lot of people that I've seen this week, who, uh, friends of mine who've seen the show um, afterwards, they bring that up, they're like, wow, and we, they knew the ending, but they were still kind of moved by how all the different characters approached their death. So that's profound, I think. Okay, last question. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Which one? Okay, yeah, great. You're playing a real person who really lived in the world. Is that different? Um, and do you, what responsibility do you feel? Like? Um, it's so funny because I feel like lately all the roles I've played have been <laughs> real people. I, I, it's, I, I mean, I guess it depends on what it is, but yes, I mean, I felt like I wanted to honor Ida Strauss, who did a really brave and beautiful, loving thing by going to her death with her husband. And I think, um, yeah, you have to honor that. I mean, I'm not, do, I, who knows what she spoke like or how she moved or any of those things, but I, I you know, I want to pay tribute to her. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I totally mm -hmm. agree. I, I just, uh, yeah, I think I feel a responsibility to uh, present Isadora's, uh, you know, wonderful man who was brave and didn't make it. Yeah. Oh, we got one more, because we got, we can't end on that note. It's just, <laughs> it's too rough. It's too rough. Uh, this, this woman waving, sure, right there, back there. Brandon Uranowitz in his villain era. <laughs> the question is, is Brandon Uranowitz in his villain era, is that true for ragtime? What? Ragtime. Yeah, because I'm like talking to like a villain. No, no, no. <laughs> um, no. Uh, I'm in my villain era right now. Um, I'm loving it. Uh, um, but I'm excited. I'm, I'm very excited for. I mean, I, this is about Titanic, but I am very excited for Ragtime. Um, uh, it's not necessarily part of my villain chapter, but. Um, it is, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a big full circle moment for me. I was in the original production as the little boy in Toronto um, when I was 11 years old. And um, uh, they took that entire company to Broadway except for me. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. Um, <laughs> So uh, it was very deeply traumatic for me, so I'm very excited actually to- Justice for Brandon. <laughs>